Hi, Dr. Yas here. I'd like to talk about the difference between a rotator cuff tear and a rotator cuff strain. I think it is important to delineate the difference between the two because a strain is nothing more than the response of a muscle that does not have enough force output to respond to the force requirements of an activity and the strain occurs versus the premise of a tear, which simply is identified through the use of an MRI. And because the tear is identified, the implication is this tear is what is causing your pain. So I think you really need to understand the difference between a tear and a strain and understand the difference in the presentation of symptoms that would come if in fact an acute tear was causing symptoms versus a strain causing symptoms and the tear being found being a chronic degenerative tear, which is doing nothing. It simply occurred, the body has healed it, and it's simply that it shows up on an MRI because you happen to take the MRI. So let's start with why a strain would occur. So when we're using our arms, there's a lot of stability and support of the weight of the arm and the object that's being manipulated by the shoulder and shoulder blade musculature. People often think that it's your arms that are supporting the object you're manipulating, but in fact, it's the arm being supported along with the object by the shoulder and shoulder blade musculature. So there's uh, several muscles that are involved in this, one being the group of muscles known as the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff's primary function is to sustain the head of the arm bone in the shoulder joint to create stability. So the other major reason that we have a rotator cuff is that as you're raising your arm, the tendency will be for the head of the arm bone to rise as you raise your arm, and that could lead it to impinge on the space that should be maintained between the shoulder bone that sits on top and the arm bone that's below. So the rotator cuff actually attaches to the shoulder blade slightly below the level of the head of the arm bone. So as it contracts, it pulls down on the head of the arm bone, which sustains that space between the shoulder bone and the arm bone. So it is known as a humeral head depressor, meaning that it's keeping the head of the arm bone from rising, which ultimately can lead to impingement of the bicep tendon that happens to run through that space between the shoulder bone on top and the head of the arm bone below. So what happens is that if all the muscles aren't strong enough, and there are groups of muscles required to not only keep the shoulder blade against the rib cage to create stability, but also have to move the shoulder blade along with the arm bone in the shoulder joint. They actually have movement that occurs at both as you're moving your arm. So if some of these muscles are weakened, they don't have the right force, there's some sort of imbalance leading to some sort of what the length of the muscles, they'll strain causing the rotator cuff to try to pick up, compensate, break down, and strain. Now, it's important to understand that what's happening when a strain is occurring is, and again, this is a Yas Method theoretical premise. You're never going to find this in any other book or anywhere else. No medical practitioner has created this theoretical basis. This is something I developed because I was trying to understand what happens to a muscle and why you seem to experience nodding. This is the explanation as to why nodding occurs at a muscle. So basically, the force requirement for an activity is such, if the force output of the muscles required to perform the activity are less than the force requirement of the activity, then the body is going to perceive that you can tear the muscle. And it doesn't want that to happen. So what it does is it takes the fluid-based sarcoplasm that's in the muscle, which is acting as a lubricant 
while the muscle fibers are pulling on each other to create force and converts it to an Elmer's gluey type of substance. This binds the fiber together. If the fiber is bound together, it can't go through its optimal length. If it can't go through its optimal length, it can't create its optimal force. And as a result, this binding of the fiber prevents the muscle from tearing. So I want people to start to recognize that straining, again, based on the YAS theoretical basis, is actually the body's preventative mechanism preventing the muscle from tearing. So that's why nodding occurs. So for anybody having nodding who is being told that the answer is to do some sort of needling or any other ridiculous procedure that is being done to a knot, the only way to stop the knotting from occurring is causing strengthening of the appropriate muscle so that the force output of the muscle is greater than the force requirement of the activity, which then allows the muscle to perform the activity and the body does not perceive that it will tear, thereby leading to the knotting. The knotting is the indicator, the resultant of the body's fear that the muscle is going to tear. So that's what straining is. Straining is really the resultant of the fear of the body that a muscle is going to tear, causing the fluid in the muscle to be converted to an Elmer's gluey substance, which leads to knotting. And because you knot, you're concentrating the muscle fiber together. Pain receptors are found along the muscle fibers. So in concentrating the pain receptor, uh, painting, concentrating the muscle fiber, you're also concentrating the pain receptors. That's why not, knots are so painful when you press on them. Okay? So that's what's going on. So in the case of straining, the way to stop straining is to strengthen the appropriate muscles. Now let's look at tearing. Tears occur all the time in muscle. They shouldn't occur if you have the appropriate strength, then muscles do what they're supposed to. They function appropriately. And you don't ever see tears. But if you haven't developed enough strength, you might get some progressive degenerative tears that occur. These are very, very slow in progression. They're taking years to develop, and they're not even eliciting a symptom because they're not acute enough to do so. So in the majority, and I mean 95, 98% of cases, when you're finding a tear on an MRI because you had pain from a strain, and you're told, oh, it's a tear, the tear that's being found is degenerative, progressive in nature. It was there way before you had your pain. It'll be there way after you have your pain. But most importantly, it requires no intervention. Nothing has to be done. This is another example of the false premise, which again, I say is the greatest fallacy ever perpetuated on man in relating to the medical field, this idea that because the structural variations found on an MRI, that the mere presence of it requires intervention is complete lunacy. It's absolute lunacy. So that's why it's so important to differentiate a degenerative tear from an acute tear. An acute tear. Now, to create an acute tear of the rotator cuff, there has to be some sort of trauma. A classic example is of a patient that was on a ladder, they slipped, they fell backwards, tried to stop themselves from falling, put their hands behind them. Yes, by all means, that can create an acute rotator cuff tear. What would be the difference in symptoms? In this particular case, just before the fall, that person had full range of motion, no pain, no nothing. After the fall, there is a dramatic loss of range of motion, dramatic along with severe pain, but you would also expect to see some sort of bleeding internally in the joint because you've torn something. When you tear something, the cell wall must be broken, therefore blood comes out of the cell. So I'd expect that if we were talking about an acute tear. In the case where these chronic degenerative tears are found, in the majority of cases I've treated where someone was diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear as the cause of their pain, that person had almost full range of motion. So that doesn't make sense. That clearly would not be what you'd expect from an acute tear. They had full range of motion. Their pain had been there for some period of time, and yet they couldn't even account for a specific incident that led to the creation of their pain. Well, if you had an acute rotator cuff tear, you would certainly remember an event that led to that. So hopefully you start to understand this stuff has to make sense. It's not just that some 
medical practitioner tells you something and you have to accept that, you got to start getting a little smarter. Start understanding what the presentation of symptoms would be if what they were saying was true. More importantly, if what they're saying is not true. That's what you have to start so that you can make a decision whether that tear is in fact causing your symptom or not. Recognize that in the vast majority, almost all cases, barring a traumatic incident, the rotator cuff tears being found are degenerative, chronic in nature. They are not eliciting symptoms at all. They were there before. If you had taken your MRI a day, a week, a month, six months before you had pain, you would have found that exact chronic degenerative rotator cuff there before. A quick story just to reinforce the point. A gentleman who's an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in treating professional baseball pitchers does an MRI study on 31 professional baseball pitchers pitching at the top of their game with absolutely no pain whatsoever. The results were 87% of them were found to have rotator cuff tears. 90% were found to have labral tears. That's 87% rotator cuff, 90% labral tears. In a group of 31 professional baseball pitchers with absolutely no shoulder pain and pitching at the top of their game. His conclusion was, if you want to do surgery on somebody, simply get an MRI. Hopefully you could read into his point, And that is that MRIs find structural variations on innumerable people, whether you have pain or don't have pain. That is the reason why you cannot justify the simple identification of it as a reason to treat. Simply because it's justified. So hopefully you're getting to understand the difference between a strain, which is the primary reason you're getting shoulder pain, versus that ridiculous diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear that was found on an MRI, which in almost all cases is degenerative, chronic, and has nothing to do with eliciting pain. If you want to get more information about the YAS method and its ability to properly diagnose you and treat you, if the cause is muscular, which it is in 95 to 98% of cases, go to my website at www.mitchellyoss.com. You can email me if you want to speak directly to me. You want to have a, a, a dialogue so that you could better understand what's going on with you. Then contact me at drmitch at mitchellyass.com. That's Dr. Mitch at mitchellyass.com. Or simply call me on my cell phone. I avail myself to anybody who's looking for an answer. As far as I'm concerned, I know what nobody else does. Why? That I can't answer. But the fact is that the YAS method is the only true method to properly diagnose and treat. It is the only method capable of identifying all potential tissues. And therefore, you're going to get an accurate answer. The number is 516-449-1359. I don't really care how you get the information, but please find the YAS method. Get the treatment you need. Let's stop the sustained chronic pain you're suffering. Let's get you the life back that you deserve, the quality of life, the full functional capacity of the life. Let's get you everything that you deserve and need from the medical establishment. The Yas Method is your only true path. For now, this is Dr. Mitchell Yas wishing you a pain-free, fully functional life. Bye-bye.